We're fully expecting them to come in and get rid of fire and rehire, make sure minimum service levels are not there. I mean, we're fully expecting them to do that. If they actually kept some of these awful laws that were stopping worker organisation and for workers to, to take their to take strike action, I think the movement would need to do something about that. If we don't get commitments now about what Labour will do when they get in, they may not listen to us very much once they're in. Sharon, we'll start with your name and your title. Uh, Sharon Graham, General Secretary of Unite. So we've had 18 months of strikes, or sorry, 18 months of anti-strike legislation, 18 months of anti-protest legislation. What have you done to convince your members that it's still worth being in a union? Well, look, we've had 900, uh, we've had 900 disputes in 18 months. So we've had 900 strikes just in 18 months, and we've won 400 million pounds back into those workers' pockets. So actually, the strikes have really been affected. 20% pay rises, some in the buses, to 8% pay rises in manufacturing, a huge amount of pay rises across the board so um, you know we have really been successful in the strike so we put on our membership by 30,000 net uh, has gone up so you, we, we think uh, our members are staying in for that reason overall though membership down 200,000 across the unions what do you think what, what's responsible for that yeah I mean I think the important thing um, when you are looking at a dispute is that you're not going to win every dispute, but you do have to win disputes. You have to win disputes because if you take members out in, in, on strike, um, they're, you know, they're not getting the money they're supposed to be getting, etc., etc. You have to be able to show that you can win those disputes um, because people do not want to come and join victims. They want to come and join a trade union that's going to fight. Um, so for us in Unite, just in the last year, we've put on over 30,000 new members net. It's quite hard to put it on net because, of course, people are moving around all the time. So we're definitely getting a bounce from the fact that we've won so many disputes. So um, for us, we've sort of bucked the trend on that. But I do think winning disputes, you won't win everything, I'm not suggesting that, but it is important to put things in place. So we have got forensic accountants now, we've got economists, uh, we do what's called Strike Plus, we do leverage. So if the strike isn't moving, we bring other things in to try and force uh, that situation. So that's why we've been quite successful. 80% of them have been won, covered over 200,000 members. Do you think the minimum service level bill, I mean, do you think that's got the potential with the onus now going on to the worker and to the individual, do you think it's got the potential to put people off from striking? Well, look, I, I actually negotiate with lo lots of blue chip companies. You know, we're a very big union. We've got 1.1 million members, 19, we, we're over 19 sectors. Um, and in, in, those, in those companies, they don't think it's workable. The companies don't think it's workable uh, because all that will happen is if everybody can't go out in the proper fashion that we usually do that, then you just extend the strike. So actually, the strike will just, just ends up lasting for longer. So I am going to be really interested to see what the employers do. But in Unite's rule book, the rule book that we have, which is quite different, I think, from other unions' rule books, is that we have a section in there that says we don't have to always work within the law if something is happening to, to our members where we have to really push back. Um, and so for me, um, if I believe that there is an issue that we have to push back on, then I will use everything in my power to do that. Um, so with strikes, we pay strike pay. We've had £32 million that we paid out in 18 months. And if there was a situation where my members were being pushed in a way that I needed to exert a particular action, then I would do that. So, I mean, big wins on the dispute front, mm. but not so... Not so many wins with Starmer. I mean, just last summer, he didn't want uh, the shadow front bench on the picket line. I mean, how have you managed to do it without the help of the opposition leader? Well, I mean, that case is a case in point, isn't it? Like, so he's saying as the Labour leader that we don't want MPs on a picket line. And for me, I said to him at the time, it's not because I thought these MPs were going to change the course of history, but actually you've made picket lines a dirty place. You've made it like it's a bad place to be. How could you say that as the Labour leader? That's outrageous for you to say that. Yeah. Um, but for me, I have, I'm in conversations with him a lot. Um, um, you know, I hope that we change minds in conversation, but actually, if we don't do that, then you have to campaign in order to get things done. So energy, renationalisation of energy, I spoke about it today in the speech. Um, they're not going to move on that, so I'm going to have to find a way to um, make them move or to encourage them to move, should I say. And so we are mounting campaigns in particular constituencies around the renationalisation of energy because the real decision makers for Labour right now are the electorate. And if the electorate moves, they're going to have to move. And so for me, the talks are fine and dandy, but um, you, know, you have to have another way to try and move these things. So do you think he's moving away from the electorate? Well, I think that, you know, there's odd, uh, I think the problem is they've got too, they, they're too cautious. I mean, I want a Labour government. I mean, that, I've made, I mean, it's not the shock of the century. That's not a scoop of the century. I want a Labour government, but I want one that's going to do something. Um, and so for me, this sort of caution that they're talking about, th the country is crying out for change. It's literally saying someone, you know, grab hold of me and we're crying out for change. Um, and, you know, cash is king in change. 
Where is the money going to come from if everything's, we've got to wait for high growth? We won't get high growth very quickly. We haven't had it since the 1970s. So I think the electric will get louder nearer the election. Mm -hmm. um, and when the electric gets louder near an election, politicians listen. Uh, that's how you move the political centre ground. Once the electorate starts to move, politicians move. That's what I've learned over many years. Um, and I think on renationalisation of energy, I think on our steel production and how we could have be the biggest uh, green steel uh, producer in Europe. I think on those things, if we're in those towns where the steel jobs are, where, where, where people, where the energy jobs are, where people have got really high bills, then I think they will make the change. I think they will force the change. I mean, even with this crumbling concrete story that we've had for the mm. last week and a half, and Starmer wasn't able to commit to fixing it mm -hmm. on the public purse because he doesn't know how expensive it's going to be. Mm -hmm. Will you be encouraging more public investment from him? Yes, because obviously things like, you know, if you take, if you take the schools, um, you know, actually, whoever gets in is going to have to deal with this. You can't say we're going to wait for high growth and, and, and the ceilings are falling down on children's schools. I mean, there's going to have to be a plan of action for that. And actually, it's better to say we're going to have a plan of action for this because that is what's going to have to happen. But right the way through to public sector pay. I mean, in the pandemic, I think there was a real shift about how people perceived workers going out. The workers that went out to look after us were bin workers, bus workers, NHS workers, low paid workers. They weren't the highly paid workers of society. I think people changed their perception of what, what, of what is happening to workers overall. That's why strikes are really supported at the moment. Um, so I think that there's a sense of fairness now about the fact that health workers should get a proper pay rise. They haven't had one yet. They're still waiting for their proper pay rise. So I think he is going to have to put more money in, into public investment, not just about structure, but also about pay for public sector workers. I mean, on the, back, back onto the minimum service level bill, mm -hmm. The first union that's probably going to be affected by that is Mick Lynch and the yeah, RMT. Yeah. They're going to be right on the front line of that. I mean, they don't really have many levers to pull because they aren't affiliated with mm -hmm. the union. But I mean, I'm, I'm assuming that you would want to come out and show some kind of solidarity and support if they are. Mm -hmm. Would you ever consider disaffiliating over it? Well, I mean, obviously, if Labour come in and they don't and they don't repeal the minimum service level, I think there will be an absolute outrage. I mean, we're I mean, we're fully expecting them to come in and get rid of fire and rehire, make sure minimum service levels are not there. I mean, we're fully expecting them to do that. You know, I was given an analogy the other day that, you know, when you have a child, you sort of feed them until they leave home. You sort of expect that to happen. I expect them to do certain things. What I'm trying to push them on is stuff on top of that, the renationalisation of energy, etc. Um, if they did that, if they actually kept some of these awful laws that were stopping worker organisation and for workers to, to take their to take strike action, I think the movement would need to do something about that uh, because that just would not be acceptable. Well, what can the movement do? Well, I mean, look, obviously... You know, there's many things that we can do. We've done things o over time. There's coordination of disputes. Uh, you know, I, uh, my own union um, has uh, 36,000 agreements with employers. I mean, we're a very, very big organisation. Um, you know, the trade union movement, when it comes together and it works together in a proper way, is a very, very powerful force. Uh, and that's what I was saying in my speech today. You know, we need to have our power um, counted on mobilisation terms, not just in the currency that we give, because actually, Workers' real power is themselves. That is the real power of workers. It's what they have themselves. And so how do we help that you know, to happen? How do we make that happen? So uh, he certainly won't be on his own, that's for sure. Do you think you'll offer Starmer a time period by which he needs to complete it if he gets into government? He needs to repeal it in a certain amount of time. Well, this is the point that I'm making on uh, the New Deal for Working People. I mean, I, our union was the only union uh, that actually rejected it because they've changed it. They've rode back. Uh, so the only union affiliated. Um, so they've changed it and they've rode back. And this is the slippery slope. If you're going to row back on access for trade unions to workers, that means they can get a better deal at work. If you're going to row back on that, hang on what's going to happen to the to the other bits i mean that's just quite a small doesn't cost anything and um, so we're going to have to i think get commitments now and that's why you know i've been saying I don't agree with the people who are saying just just keep quiet hold on tight just let get, get them through the door because if we don't get commitments now about what labor will do when they get in they may not listen to us very much once they're in. So I think now's the time for us to get those commitments. Well, if you've got Pat McFadden in, in there, can you imagine he's going to want to help you out? Well, mm, I don't think he's going to be helping me out too much, I have to say. Uh, so obviously we have to find ways to uh, encourage 
uh, push people into a certain direction. I mean, we do this with employers all the time. I mean, a lot of employers that I negotiate with understand they've got to work as a fair deal. Some employers, you have to drag them kicking and screaming to the table. How do we do that? We have strike action, but we also use leverage. We also use strikes plus. You've got to do everything in your armory. And if we had a situation where management service levels were in and Labour was still in government, then you know, this movement would have to do something about that.